In today's episode of Rob Conrad Conversations, Jamie Poole. A suit saved my life, quite literally, that I was uh, on my way to an internship and they turned around and they asked if I was okay. And then as soon as I said that, I took a few more steps, turned, hit the wall and just sort of walked into the wall and then collapsed down. This normal 30-year-old Australian man so I'd already had three cardiac arrests now in two weeks and I was sort of back at work on the Monday and in hindsight again, I probably should have taken some more time off. And Has died nine times already. There's either two scenarios that happen. Is I die and get brought back to life or I just die. I mean, obviously, you don't want to die. And live to tell the tale got enough practice now these days to <laughs> sort of call it the eight seconds of dying and I can't even describe to people that sort of the dread and the sort of fear that you feel your heart starts to struggle all of the blood in your body gets sort of diverted back up to your heart and your lungs to try and keep the important things still running you start to go hypoxic your, you know your brain doesn't get enough blood anymore and enough oxygen so it's sort of just this sort of really you, you know you get dread feeling sickness it's just it's not, a, it's not a fun experience, you know. You've got one life, it's not very long. Don't not do things, don't, don't make up excuses to do stuff. Join the conversation now. Welcome to Rob Conrad Conversations. Conversations with extraordinary people that motivate and inspire. Learn, grow, and impact lives. Subscribe now and hit the bell icon for a new conversation every week. Here comes the sunshine and burns away clouds like they never... Hey, welcome. This is Rob Connett from Switzerland. There is one question that I'm sure everyone, at least at some point in their life, has asked, and that is, what's it like to die? Um, it's quite hard to get a reliable answer to that because usually people who have died, well, they're dead and they're not really helpful in finding answers. But today I'm going to talk to someone who might be able to answer this question because he has died, not once, but nine times actually. Jamie Poole was born with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, a heart condition that's not even that rare and often goes unnoticed, but sometimes in its more severe form leads to cardi cardiac arrest and the person dying, which happened to Jamie the first time when he was 20 years old and happened eight more times in the 10 years since. So we'll talk about death, I guess, and life and what it's like to live with a condition like this and much more. Thank you so much for taking the time, Jamie Poole. Hi, yeah, thanks for having me. Uh... <laughs> thanks for taking the time. Um, I guess the elephant's question in the room is, what's it like to die? What does dying feel like? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I guess, I mean, I, I know you're going to get to the email straight away. So I probably should clarify first that what I experience is a, a cardiac arrest. So I go into what's called either polymorphic VT uh, or VF, which is ventricular fibrillation or uh, ventricular tach tachycardia, um, which basically just means my heart rate goes into a rhythm that's not sustainable for life. And mm -hmm. either I'm going to get sort of that corrected externally through a defibrillator or I will die. But I think, you know, the, the sort of, a lot of people that do sort of hear my story online and sort of do comment, they're like, oh, but he didn't die because he'd be dead. And I'm like, well, it's a cardiac <laughs> arrest. And if, if I didn't get the intervention, I would be dead. So yeah. it's, uh, it's definitely so. So that's, that's the sort of first sort of clarification. I know it's a bit illegal. Um, but there, in terms of sort of what it is to experience those, um, it's, uh, you know, I call it, I, I guess I've sort of got enough practice now these days to <laughs> sort of call it the eight seconds of dying. And that sort of stems from this sort of conversation I had with a cardiologist once who said that I've got an ICD implanted. So um, I, it's sort of like a little box that sits here um, and it will sort of charge up an electric shock and sort of give me a shock when my heart needs to sort of reset that dangerous rhythm. Um, and so he said that it takes about eight seconds for that to sort of charge up once it's detected that I'm in a cardiac arrest. And so for those eight seconds, sometimes I've sort of been awake for, to experience all of those eight seconds and I've gone into cardiac arrest. And so I'm sort of like, you know, you're going through this feeling of like, where well, I've got eight seconds left to live. What do you do? And sort of, you know, people ask, like, you know, do you know if you're going to make it or not? And you're like, well, you 
don't really like you hope and the device is obviously very advanced and very capable of sort of doing it but you just you still you've sort of got to live with those sort of eight seconds of sort of not knowing and it's sort of it's the scariest sort of dread feeling you get you know there, there have been some instances where doctors have tried to ask me to sort of push through those eight seconds and sort of you know keep doing what I was doing even when I sort of felt those eight seconds but I can't even describe to people that sort of the dread and the sort of fear that you feel when you just like you just your stomach drops you sort of you get sick and I think you know doctors have said that that's because when you're cardiac when you do go into cardiac arrest and your heart starts to struggle all of the blood in your body gets sort of diverted back up to your heart and your lungs mm -hmm. to try and keep the important things still running and so if you've got you know a stomach it will get upset you start to go hypoxic your you know your brain doesn't get enough blood anymore and enough oxygen so it's sort of just this sort of really you, you know you get dread feeling sickness it's just it's not a it's not a fun experience. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, but there's some there are instances where you are out basically completely because we talked before and you mentioned that you had these almost weird dream experiences and then you realize oh this is not this is not this is actually not happening. I, I <laughs> this is not yeah this room definitely yeah. yeah I yeah. mean you know I I I I consider myself an atheist so I don't necessarily believe in the sort of uh, afterlife near-death experiences that sort of some people will sort of have sort of experienced but I definitely have sort of been through those sort of visions I guess or those sort of experiences in that yeah definitely you know sometimes uh, there was one where I was walking up the stairs uh, of my office and then sort of I went to New York and there was loud like I could hear the the car horns I could see the yellow taxis I looked up and there was the train flying over me and I sort of took about 10 seconds and then I woke up and I was like, oh, I'm back in London. I'm not actually in like, I never went to New York. And, you know, I guess, you know, that could be considered an out-of-body experience or, you know, I don't know, even purgatory if you want to think that purgatory is New York City. <laughs> New York um, you know, Sorry to any New Yorkers out there, but, you know, I'm just saying you might, uh, you might be in purgatory. Um, and then, yeah, and so other times I've had sort of the feelings of the, the golden light. So the most recent one that happened was on a treadmill. And so I sort of went down on the treadmill. And just sort of, I don't really remember like any specifics, like I did the, the New York example, but it was just a sort of yellow, golden sort of, color is sort of what I remember, like a warmth and a color. And that's sort of what I remember from that experience. And and so again, you know, that sort of does sound very similar to how some people do describe these sort of supernatural experiences. So I can definitely understand, you know, where where they may be coming from, but I don't necessarily believe there's anything magical or supernatural about them at all. Okay. Okay. So um, maybe let's go back a bit and, and talk about your condition. So what... Um, You mentioned it's something that's quite um, common. It's like one in 500 or something. Um, yeah, so I mean, here in the UK, at least, it's uh, one in 500. Um, I, I wouldn't be certain of the worldwide stats, but I've been told it's a relatively common heart condition and it's a congenital heart disease. So it's passed down through the genes, through your family. Um, and yeah, so I think while the actual disease is common, You know, members of my family and other people that I've met who have the disease can go their entire lives without even knowing they have it and sort of even experiencing any sort of problems with it. So it's sort of, there's a very sort of varied scale on sort of how much you get affected by it. And unfortunately, I think I'm at the, the wrong end of the scale on that, <laughs> on that sort of side of things. But yeah, there's definitely, you know, uh, situations where you can probably go with living a normal life with that, uh, with the condition. Okay, so that condition runs in your family, actually. Yeah, so um, it's it's weird because I think I mean I, I'm not a sort of a doctor in the cardiology field, but from what I'm sort of being told, it's a relatively new discovery. And I think in terms of I think it's 20 or 30 years ago that they really started to do research on this. And I've got family members. I, I had a, a cousin who, before I was born died from a cot death and what they sort of attributed as a, a cot death when he was three years old. Mm -hmm. And my and his mother, my auntie, does have the condition and she then later uh, suffered problems from it as well and sort of went into heart failure. And so in hindsight, they realized that perhaps her son didn't die of a cot death. He died of a sudden cardiac arrest that like I've experienced. And unfortunately, you know, they didn't know how to diagnose that or sort of prove that back 
in in those days. So yeah, I think it's definitely it's you know knowledge is always getting better of it, but it's something that's run through our family. I think for as long as sort of our current generation is alive, and I've got a uh, you know, a family, another one of my aunties whose uh, sons and daughters also have the condition to a severe extent. Uh, one of my cousins has had a, a heart transplant quite young, mm-hmm. um, and, and another couple of cousins have the ICD implanted, and I've had a few uh, cardiac arrests themselves. So unfortunately, our family got the uh, short end of the stick on the genes for uh, <laughs> for this for this particular disease. Okay, okay. And uh, you were 20 when you had your first um, cardiac arrest, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's 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 crazy looking back, and there were signs when I was growing up, and, and it's hard to sort of again, you know, going back to that sort of idea that perhaps they didn't really know how to identify it, and. You know, I used to be a really active child and sort of played every sport that I could. I was, you know, quite into soccer or, or football and uh, cricket and sort of played in sort of all the local competitions. And I remember like it was always hard to run for me. Like, and, you know, a lot of these things, I guess, even, even to this day, I still, you know, it, it's one of the biggest challenges when I, when I come to this is like, am I actually feeling it worse than other people are feeling it you know mm-hmm. you don't have that sort of you know so when you're a kid and you say oh it hurts to run mm-hmm. you sort of have to just you, you kind of just want to keep it to yourself because you're just like oh well it hurts for everybody and you're just being a little bit of a a sook about it so you know and little things like that and there was a case where i sort of couldn't breathe once in a cinema and i really struggled to breathe and sort of you know, I don't know what what exact happened, but we went to the doctors and they prescribed a a, a puffer for asthma. asthma mm-hmm. And I didn't have asthma, and after a month, we went off it, and I never got the symptoms again. But you know, maybe that was a, an, another early sign of of this condition. And um, yeah, so you know, all through my life, and, and then you know, even growing going through my teenage years, I you know, sort of my number one and two preferences for jobs, sort of that I wanted to be when I grow up was uh, either in the air force or as a police officer. And mm-hmm. I was lucky enough to go through the uh, Australian Air Force uh, sort of application process, and I got recommended to become an officer in the Air Force, and mm-hmm. went through the sort of the whole process. And they, they didn't pick it up once in the uh, medical sort of testing that I had this okay. condition, and so it just sort of you know it, it really struck me as like, well, you know, that opportunity didn't play out. But what if I was in a two billion dollar jet when I had the uh, a cardiac arrest? And you know, it's sort of mm-hmm. it's crazy that this thing sort of was with me this whole time. Time and only until I was twenty did it sort of decide to sort of rear its head and and come out. Okay, okay. And what happened when you were twenty? Can you describe that experience? Yeah, so it sort of. I mean, it's it's hard to say because I was in a coma for a week after I had this event. So um, you know, and it was scary. They told my mom and my family that I, I wouldn't wake up the same. You know, they they were preparing her to say that. I would have severe brain damage from the amount of time that I went without oxygen, and um, the, you know, and so they were sort of really surprised that I was even awake, but I'd have suffered memory loss from it. So I definitely, I can't remember a month before the event. I can't remember wow. sort of the day, and I can't remember sort of a week or two afterwards, and sort of really lost that sort of memory. And it's quite funny, you know, my friends that sort of come in, and there was, there was a, a football grand final on the weekend that I had the. Uh, cardiac arrest and or the week before the weekend before I had the cardiac arrest and I was like oh who won the football and then I was like oh did you know did we do anything and everyone's like yeah we went to your house for a party don't you remember and I'm like <laughs> no like you never come to my house for a party since when do we have parties in my house like you, and so it's really, it really interesting but yeah unfortunately don't sort of remember that much um, I do obviously know the details that I was uh, on my way to an internship uh, in the city um, so I sort of was at the local train station just getting the sort of normal commute into work um, and I sort of was running there's an overpass to get to the next platform so I sort of I think I'm, I'm, I jogged up the stairs over the overpass and mm. sort of moved on to the next platform and as I was moving over uh, I spoke to a couple who were in front of me uh, a couple of weeks later and they said that I went down on one knee and they've sort of seen that and they turned around and they asked if I was okay. And apparently I've stood straight back up again and said, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. And then as soon as I said that, I took a few more steps, turned, hit the wall and just sort of walked into the wall and then collapsed down okay. for good. And, you know, it's uh, it's interesting that we're saying that, 
you know, people were sort of walking around me and over me and they're like, you know, and even they themselves, they say, you know, if I wasn't wearing a suit that day, they wouldn't have actually stopped me because they may have thought I was just on drugs or drunk okay. or, okay. you know, something. so it, it is, it's quite a, uh, quite shocking. That's an idea that, you know, a suit saved my life <laughs> quite literally. <laughs> Luckily I wore a suit that day. So you still I don't have know it? What to, yeah, I still got this. Uh, I actually <laughs> still have the t-shirt. I've got the actual t-shirt I was wearing, the paramedics, obviously when they came to, finally do the CPR and the, they sort of ripped it open and it's all torn to shreds and it was my favorite t-shirt so after I woke, <laughs> yeah. after I wake up my one of my first questions was like where's my t-shirt like where's the shirt and so I've still got it now with me like now in London 10 years later it's sitting at my bedside table <laughs> so it's a nice, <laughs> nice little keepsake to know where I've come from yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah. so so how long um how much time uh between when you kind of I had collapsed and when the, uh, the paramedics arrived, how much time was uh, passed? passed? Yeah, no, this is, uh, so, I mean, I, I was told that it was quite a long time from the start. So uh, that's why they were telling my family that I was probably going to wake up with brain damage and that um, I think, you know, early figures I'd heard were 45 minutes that I was sort of out of it before they Ooh, sort of wow. okay. to that's long. bring me sort of back and, you know, and, and that always sort of, you know, sort of shocked me and, the, you know, they broke down the odds, you know, and that, you know, and it, it, around the world sort of globally, if you have an out of home cardiac arrest and you don't have a defibrillator implanted, the chances of survival just full stop are 10%. Mm -hmm. So only one in 10 people survive these events normally. And then if you require more than 15%, 15 minutes of CPR or, you know, if, if you don't sort of get that attention you need straight away, the chances drop down 4%, 1% and sort of, you know, even lower than 1%. And then for then after that to wake up without any brain damage, or at least I think I haven't got any brain damage, <laughs> um, you know, to wake up with no brain damage, I think, you know, I was really, really super lucky. Um, but yeah, so I've, it wasn't until last year that I actually got the official paramedics report from the events and eight years later until I got the report. Um, and it's just a super interesting read that I think, you know, it took them eight minutes to get to me originally. And so that's eight minutes without any sort of support. And I, I asked the the couple who were in front of me when I met them, did you start CPR? And they said, no. So, you know, uh, like I, I have to imagine somebody <laughs> did, did some CPR initially. Um, otherwise, I shouldn't be here. But yeah, it took eight minutes for the paramedics to get there. And then it took them 19 minutes for them to get a sort of a registrable rhythm. Um, that took six shocks. They shot me with five shots of adrenaline. Um, and yeah, it's just sort of, you know, reading that report, it's crazy sort of how many steps. And I think overall it took about 38 minutes from me sort of going down like as a notable time when they caught, when they actually called the ambulance to when the ambulance was sort of had me in, a, I forget the actual medical term, but uh, like in a, a rhythm suitable for transport. So it's still not, you're still obviously not very sort of healthy or safe, but There, they feel Stable capable to pick, to pick you up and move yeah. you to the hospital. Okay. Um, so yeah, so that that process took 33, uh, 38 minutes, and then obviously I was in. As soon as I got to the hospital, they put me in a cryo therapy, I think it's called, or something similar to that, where they basically just put me in an ice bath and cooled my brain down, made sure that I was sort of you know, to reduce any swelling and things like that. Um, and then in, put me into a medically induced coma to sort of recover from that. And yeah, a week later I sort of woke up and it's just amazing. Mm -hmm. Like I can't even, they must have done everything perfect. Like they've obviously done everything perfectly for after I've read that report and sort of knowing where I've come to now and sort of I'm, I'm healthy, I'm alive or, you know, he healthy uh, <laughs> in that sense. But yeah, it, it, it's just crazy. Uh, so what was your first memory when you woke up or what did you, uh, how did you feel when you woke up? And did you, did you realize why you are? Did you realize hey, I'm in a hospital? No, or is yeah, it just like, no, it was hey, I was weird. just running to the I mean, train yeah. and now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was, uh, you know, I sort of wake up and I probably didn't help my mom's sort of fears that I might have brain damage because I think, you know, I was obviously very drugged out on sort of the different sort of medications they had me on. And I think one of my friends came in and they were saying that, like, I just kept asking, like, oh, cool, like, how you been? What have you been up to? And then my friend would answer, oh, I've been doing such and such. And then it'd be like, 
oh, cool. So how you been? What have you been up to? <laughs> and then I just keep repeating <laughs> the same question over and over again. So that probably didn't help. But um, yeah, I do remember one of the first memories. I remember the nurse coming in to do a, a sort of a brain function test or a sort of, you know, they asked me a series of questions, just sort of really basic general knowledge stuff that sort of, I guess, indicates where my brain function is at. And uh, I got nine out of 10. And I actually, I answered, uh, I think the question was, who is the Prime Minister of Australia. So this happened in Australia at the time. And I was like, George Bush. <laughs> and they all just sort of looked around. And I'm like, oh, no, wait, what? So I, I got it wrong. And I think that counted as a, as a sort of a soft fail on that side of things. But then there was, yeah, obviously after that, uh, about three. So interesting enough for me, I didn't realize this was a thing, but the paramedics actually fractured three of my ribs. So I didn't even know that was a thing that when you do CPR mm-hmm. that you might, you might push hard enough to actually fracture oh, somebody's right ribs. Um, and so they had fractured three of my ribs. And so I just remember that sort of first month out of hospital being strapped up around the chest, just hurting, you know, couldn't, every time I had to cough or sneeze, oh, I was yeah, just like bad. bracing bad, yeah. myself, you know, just, my ribs as well yeah, once. <laughs> just pain for those first few weeks. And, and yeah, you know, and I think a little bit of paranoia and fear because, you know, I had to sort of come to terms with living with this sort of box that mm. is, like, you know, at the time I thought it was a little ticking time bomb, you know, I thought, you know, one day it is going to shock me, you know, is it going to hurt? What's it going to, you know, feel like? And so there's a lot of bit of confusion and just a bit of fear around that as well. So they implanted um, that device right after the first um, incident. Yeah. So while I was unconscious, so I just, I woke up with the device, um, I think they sort of discovered that I had this hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and it was thick enough. And obviously because I'd had a sudden cut, I think, you know, even just the fact of having the cardiac arrest out of home is just immediate qualification to put one in, you know, it's, I'm not sure if they knew I would have it again, but I think it's just, you know, it's obviously happened once. So they imagined that it was going to happen again. Um, so yeah, it's that I, I sort of woke up with this sort of, again, so rib strapping and then a, a shoulder strapping with this little sort of little box sticking out of my chest, um, which was yeah another sort of thing to sort of get used to. And, so it's, you know. it's an external box and then uh, a little wire goes in your chest. Or? No, so it's sort of it's uh, subcutaneous. Uh, so oh, okay. again, not being a, in the medical industry, uh, I think it's a, it's it's underneath a layer of sort of skin and fat, and then mm-hmm. but above the muscle, okay. and so it sort of sits and sort of does bulge out a little bit, and then the wire sort of I think goes through one of the veins or the arteries um, that then leads straight into the heart, and it's quite scary getting an X-ray sometimes because you sort of you see it and it's this sort of like metal chain that ends down into this little piece of barbed wire down the bottom and you can sort of see it right <laughs> inside your heart and you're like, right, I don't know if that's safe, but okay. <laughs> I'll just but take your word. thing saved it. you eight more times, right? So it's, uh, exactly. It's, it's, no, not yeah, it's not too bad. It's not too bad. So then, then how much time, um, I mean, obviously you recovered from the first um, cardiac arrest and then how much time passed till the second one? Yes, it was uh, 18 months actually. Um, and, you know, at that point, yeah, I, I, I went back to my old ways, I guess, you know, and so plenty of exercise, um, you know, typical sort of I was 20. So, you know, going out, partying and, you know, I, I, I remember specifically my friends wanted to walk up one of our local mountains Um back in Australia, we've got a mountain range nearby. And I not only did I walk up it with them, that, but I was practically high on Red Bull and I hadn't slept in 24 hours and I still managed to do it and nothing happened. And, you know, it just sort of, these sort of like these little events where it's like, maybe I should have been a little bit more cautious, but then again, nothing sort of happened. So it was 18 months later and I'd almost completely forgotten about it. You know, it was sort of, I've, I've done crazy stuff now and nothing's gone wrong. So it sort of reduced my fear in that, well, if I can climb up a mountain after not sleeping for 24 hours, then I should be pretty fine doing my sort of normal, happen, yeah, yeah. normal day to day. And, um, yeah, I was, uh, I was at my cousin's, um, I took my computer over and we sort of hooked it up for a, a LAN gaming party. Um, and you know, a very unhealthy day. I think we had like KFC for lunch and pizza for dinner and, you know, lollies and, uh, sweets, um, candies and, uh, you know, just a very sort of more Red Bull and, I remember sort of about six in the morning, we were like, okay, well, let, let, let's go to bed. Let's call it a day. Um, and so I, I went downstairs of his apartment 
and I forgot my uh, phone. So I sort of jogged back up the stairs and then got my phone, jogged back downstairs. And as soon as I got back downstairs after that sort of going up and down, I just sort of felt what I now recognize as those sort of eight seconds. But at the time, I didn't know what that feeling was. And my first reaction was actually... God, I'm getting fat. Like I'm getting like <laughs> I can't even I can't even run up the stairs anymore without losing my breath. And so I was like, right, I need to go to the gym next day and get some exercise. But I was like, I'll go, I'll go lay down in the bed and just see if it if I can calm down and sort of go back to normal. And I laid down for a few seconds and it didn't go back to normal. So I was like, well, I haven't taken my medication yet, so I better go and take my heart medication. Um, and so I went into the kitchen to get a glass and remember sort of reaching up to the cabinet to, to get a glass out of the cabinet and everything just got really loud and like, you know, it, it like sort of sound of like blood rushing to my, it was just a really weird experience. But so I just remember everything getting loud and then suddenly everything was dead quiet. And I woke up and I was sort of staring at the roof of the kitchen. So then my head was sort of jammed under one of the cupboards. And I was sort of like, immediately you're just like, uh, like, uh, okay, I think I know what happened. <laughs> I think I know what okay. happened here. And so it's just this sort of initial, I guess, initial shock, but still that like, it, it's, it, it's, it's a really, yeah, it's probably like the, one of the weirdest feelings I've ever had in my life is the thought that I wasn't sure what reality was. I sort of, when I woke up, I sort of thought to myself, you know, did I actually go to my cousins last night? Like, did, mm-hmm. did I have a party last night? Because right now I felt like I just had eight hours sleep and that wouldn't make sense if I was at my, my cousins all night. I felt like I had a really nice sleep. And then I was like, wait, I'm staring at the roof. Oh, oh, okay, I see what's going on here. And at the time, again, obviously being the first time this had happened since the the big one at, at the start, I was obviously a bit bit frightened. And I don't, you don't typically have to call the paramedics after these events because the ICD should technically just take care of it. Um, but yeah, I was just a bit afraid and just sort of wanted to, you know, I had the option of, you know, should I just suck it up and sort of crawl over to the phone to call the paramedics or just yell for my cousin to come downstairs and help me. Um, So I guess, you know, probably more rightly, I I started yelling for my cousin to come down and help me out. But uh, yeah, no, so that was definitely sort of the the first time it sunk in that, okay, I've got to, like, this is a long-term thing that's going to keep happening and I need to sort of take it a bit more seriously. Okay. okay. And and, um, after that, you had a series of cardiac events at one point, you had like five within a few days. Yeah. So, I mean, again, it's just this sort of weird thing where it, it, this was another 18 months after that instance. Um, and, you know, what, it sort of made a big change in my life. And I was sort of, I was working at a, an advertising agency in my local town. And I sort of, you know, it, it, was, it was a very sort of slow sort of business there. You know, a lot of people in my local town are older and I work in digital advertising. So, you know, these, these people struggle to turn on a computer, let alone sort of buy and sort of make, make, make sales using digital, digital means. So, you know, business was a little bit slow and I sort of got given this tip, you know, like, why don't you move to London? And I was like, well, you know, I never really thought about it, to be honest. It never crossed my mind. And um, it was uh, uh, sort of in Australia, at least, you've sort of, you melt, Melbourne is your big sort of advertising capital. Um, Sydney as well, but Melbourne mostly. Um, and from where I live, Melbourne is a three day drive to get to Melbourne. So if I wanted to move my stuff down to Melbourne, I would have had to do a, wow. th- a three day okay. sort of drive to get there. Um, or, I sort of thought to myself, well, why not just pack up everything and take a three-day flight and go to <laughs> London instead and sort of follow this advice. So uh, I, I, I applied for a visa on a whim and I was like, I'm not really sure if I'm going to get approved, but mm-hmm. I'll go for it. Um, and then two weeks later, the, the visa came back and it was all approved. And I don't know, I just sort of got this bug and I got the visa on the Wednesday. On the Thursday, I went to a travel agent and said, I want a one-way ticket to London. And then on the uh, the next Saturday, I left. And so everyone was a bit shocked. They're just like, I'm bye, I'm, bi- I'm going to London next <laughs> week. Like, for good, I'll see you later. Um, and yeah, so again, it's just, you know, it's 18 months have gone by. 
I just moved to London. I had 50 kilograms of luggage. I sort of bought a second bag. So I had massive luggage with me. And some of these early hotels, you know, one thing that you'll sort of find if you like people who live in London will know it's not very friendly to people who don't like stairs. <laughs> and so every train state, you know, especially six years ago, it's gotten a little bit better now, but six years ago, none of the train stations I had to go to had stairs. So I'm try- I had to sort of try and carry these six, uh, 50 kilograms worth of luggage up and down flights of stairs through little tunnels up more hills. You know, the, none of the, uh, none of the hotels that I stayed, I stayed at cheaper hotels because I just had a few paychecks sort of with me. I, I didn't save up for it. Um, and so I stayed at cheaper hotels and they didn't have any stairs. So I've carried this 50 kilograms of luggage everywhere with me and nothing happens. <laughs> no, 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 no shock, no cardiac arrest, no, no, nothing. And then uh, sort of 18 months after that uh, original, uh, the, the first one, I was, uh, I'd got a job and I was working at an agency and yeah, sort of I went. I went down. Uh, I sort of. I was walking on my way there, and again, you know, I'd forgotten about it. Uh, but I did. I felt that feeling, and I was like, okay, I. I kind of know what that feeling is now. Um, but again, you know, this is only the second time I felt it. So I, I sort of the first. My first reaction was more, oh, I'm unfit. Not <laughs> that <laughs> anything wrong is again, happening. Yeah. It's like you know, oh, I've got to stop eating those chips. I've got to you know get it. <laughs> This diet in London hasn't helped me out, and I sort of. But I do remember at the time, and, and like I, I find it so, kind of funny in retrospect that I looked in a mirror, I looked into a window in a shop front that I was next to when I felt this feeling, mm. and I looked white, like I was just pale, like ghastly pale. And you think I look white now? Like I was, you know, there was a noticeable <laughs> like paleness to my skin, and I didn't think anything of the time. Again, I just thought, God, oh, I need to get more sun. I need. To- <laughs> <laughs> I need to go get a spray tan or something. Uh, and so I kept walking and I, I rounded the corner of the office and I saw a couple of colleagues sitting, sort of having a cigarette in the morning over the sides. And I was like, okay, well, you know, the, uh, it, I'll go say hello to them. And sort of hopefully the process of just going and sitting down with them will help everything calm down and go back to normal. And unfortunately, from what I've been told later is that, you know, once you go into these abnormal rhythms, um, it's especially with a VF, it, it's it's very like it's near impossible for it to come back naturally. You're either going to full on die or you get a defibrillation or something to stop it from happening. It's not just going to go away. So yeah, I sort of sat there and it got worse and I felt it come in and then I passed out for a few seconds. And when I woke up, one of my colleagues was like, "Oh, you're right," and I was like, "I think I just." died <laughs> they, uh, they sort of took a moment and ran upstairs and again naturally just they, they called the paramedics at this point I was like I don't need a paramedic fit they, they sort of called one and um, from that I took yeah so I mean this is I mean it's partly my fault so this is so from then a week later this was on a Thursday um, I went back to work on the Monday the next week um, I probably should have taken a few more days off um, but then I, I sort of went through the week fine and then come the next, the exact same next Thursday, the exact same time in the morning, I, I got to my office and this was the event where I was walking up the stairs and I felt fine. I felt really good. You, normally, I'm a little bit hesitant with stairs just because, of again, it feels hard. So I, and so I sort, of, I, I, I sort of take my time, but I felt really good this time. Um, and then just... I think, yeah, I just I woke up at the bottom of the st- <laughs> at the bottom of the stairwell. So, again, it's just one of those moments where you just you sort of put two and two together, and you're like, right, and sort of sprawled in this really awkward position up against the wall down on the bottom of the stairs. And again, luckily, a colleague sort of came across me as they were coming in that morning, and you know, and as as they would naturally do, they called the paramedics. But um, so that was sort of, the, and then unfortunately with that event, I had a, a, a like, so as soon as my defibrillator returned me to normal at the bottom of the stairs, my heart went straight back into those eight seconds again and I could feel it go straight back in. And so I went actually into a second <laughs> cardiac arrest straight away um, as a rebound. And from that event, because I had the two in a row, they took me to a local hospital and I had to sort of stay in observation for a couple of nights. But again, that was sort of, you know, 
I, I didn't. I went back to work the sort of the Monday after I'd sort of been released from the hospital, and I was like, "I'm fine. Yeah, I don't don't need to worry." And so I'd already had three cardiac arrests now in two weeks, and I was sort of back at work on the Monday. And in hindsight, again, I probably should have taken some more time off. And it came around. And it was a Thursday, another Thursday, yeah. and the exact same time <laughs> in the morning. And I sort of made it to the front uh, front door of the the office, and this is where I sort of started to notice the the physical effects that happened. So this time I sort of, I felt those eight seconds, but I also felt sick and I vomited. Um, and then I tried to call for help on the uh, sort of the intercom on the front of the door. And, you know, I've used that intercom for six months. So, you know, hundreds of times I'd use that intercom to sort of get into the office, but I just, I couldn't figure it out. I couldn't, mm-hmm. I didn't know what button to push, even though, it, you know, and I think that's obviously like the, a bit of hypoxia or apoxia. Um, just sort of, I couldn't think of how to do it. So I just sort of had to sit down and just think about my family and my mom and wait and hopefully, fingers crossed, wake up in a couple of seconds. Um, and obviously I did. Um, and it's quite funny. I've got the same paramedic all three times and he, 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 he was, it's you again. Ter- yeah, he, literally. He <laughs> Come was, on. You know, you, and, Make an effort and he here. Said, like, he, he, gets, he got his breakfast at a cafe around the corner from our office and he said he's been in the line for a bagel every Thursday for the last <laughs> like, four weeks. He hasn't been able to get his bagel because every time he gets a call, you I'm die. Like cardiac arrest. <laughs> and so I'm just like, oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so, sorry I died. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so that you know, those four times, and again, I, I at that point I did take two weeks off. I was like, okay, maybe my body's trying to tell me something. I should take a few weeks off now. Um, and my company was really, really good. So they um, they fl- they actually paid for my mum to fly over here to London, um, oh, wow. and they put her, put her up in accommodation just down the road from my house. Um, and you know, they covered all that and they paid for it and you know, they're, they're really amazing with it. So I was just, I've been super lucky to sort of be at the place that I work at. Um, and so I spent sort of a mini holiday with mom, two weeks just recovering and sort of getting back to what I would consider normal and sort of, you know, it, a lot of these things as well, especially around that period after I had four in a row, I was starting to get a little bit of paranoia and, you know, I was starting to sort of double guess, you know, it sounds silly, but when, you know, I'm, I don't believe in the supernatural, but when Thursday come around again, I was like, right, I'm just going to stay in bed all day. <laughs> I'm not going, yeah. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not moving. It's, it's a Thursday. Once Thursday passes, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll be good to go again. Um, but yeah, so there's a little bit of sort of this sort of like, I guess the, I think one of the, I spoke to a doctor afterwards and they said, you know, it might be PTSD or something similar to that, just from sort of the events. And, um, you know, and so that like, so just spent those weeks recovering from that and just sort of, you know, getting my mind right and back to normal. And, um, unfortunately when we all thought it was over and done, mm. uh, it sort of happened one more time. So it ended up being five in the span of six weeks. Um, so to about two weeks after I went back to work, uh, went up the stairs fine. Everything was normal. I'd been working for a couple of days already. Um, went down to get lunch and sort of jogged across the road and it was raining. So I sort of did a bit of a power walk slash jog to the cafe. Mm-hmm. And again, at that point, I was quite proud of myself. I was like, oh, look at me jogging and not mm-hmm. like not freaking out and not worrying about it. And like, mm-hmm. you know, who says I've got PTSD? I just jogged across the road. <laughs> and then... Uh, Probably, you know, I probably should have touched wood at that point. That was probably the, uh, <laughs> so I sort of, I, I, I walked up the stairs of the office again. I felt great. I was like, wow, like I walked up the stairs without even having to sort of pause or reflect or anything like that. I was really like, really, really pumped. And then uh, my HR manager at the time, she stopped me on the stairs and this is where I started to go wrong, I think. So she sort of had a chat and I was fine to have a chat, but I definitely wanted to stop at the top of the stairs just to take some deep breaths and, mm-hmm. and compose myself. And I knew I needed that. Um, but I didn't want to be, I guess, you know, sort of the British coming out of me. I didn't want to be impolite. So I kept talking with her and she started to walk into the office. And so I was like, well, I've got to follow her. I've got to keep talking to her. You know, I can't just stand here and be, you know, like let, let her go when she's talking to me. Um, so I followed her into the office and felt those eight seconds. I was like, yeah, no, I've gone into it now. And as I was walking down the corridor of the office, I was looking around and I was like, I saw some chairs. I'm like, oh, I wonder if I, like, if I just sit down here, will it go away? Like, will it help? And then I just sort of thought in my head, like, okay, well, I'll make it back to my desk. And when I get back to my desk, I'll 
sort of see if I can get myself out of it, which again, is impossible, but uh, it's what I like to tell myself <laughs> when I go into these sort of things that I, that I can help in some way. Um, so I went, got back to my desk and then I uh, started, yeah, I sat down and woke up with uh, one of my colleagues sort of cradling my head towards the ground. <laughs> so again, just mm-hmm. another one of those moments of, oh, okay, I, I, I know what happened now. <laughs> So that we are at number. So yeah, so that's six, uh, so six, that was four. Seven. So then we're at, that was six. That was the end no, of that six, was yeah. number six. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, I mean, if you want to, yeah. So number seven um, was actually I need to actually look at you know it's quite funny. I feel really bad, but um, I've died so many times now. I've actually forgotten the order in which I've done <laughs> it. <laughs> um, it's, it's like you know, I was like, "How can you forget that sort of stuff?" It's like, well, you try and remember doing something nine times. <laughs> and, uh, uh, let me so let me just I've got I've got like a list. I, I keep like a sort of diary of when these sort of things happen. So um, let me just sort of bring this up. Uh, but basically, I, I mean, I, I guess we don't really need to go into the details. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> The net one of the next ones was at an airport, um, and so I went back to Australia uh, to get my visa renewed. So it'd been three years now since I'd been, uh, uh, five years actually since I'd been in London. So I had to get my visa renewed and went back to Australia. And, and luckily, uh, serendipitously, I guess while I was over there, my grandfather got unwell, and so my my parents live in Newcastle in Sydney, but my other family lives in Brisbane, which is uh, sort of north, more north. Um, and so I had to fly up there to sort of be with my grandfather. And the week, so sort of that weekend, my dog died. And then as well, so it sort of, I get like, it's serendipitous that I was there for these sort of moments because, you know, it's just, it's weird that it all sort of came together in that week. And I happened to be there after five years. I happened to be sort of back in Australia for these things. And, so my dad, my dog died that sort of weekend, and I flew up to my grandparents' house in Brisbane. And when I was at the airport, I sort of again, it was you know, not to be, you know, I'm not superstitious, but it was a Thursday. Oh no, uh, come on, and I got, that's mean. And that's that's I, really mean. Okay. I, I did. I have asked my cardiologist, yeah. like, is there anything like? Is it because I get to a certain point in the week when, like, <laughs> you know, my body has had enough I don't know you know so it was a Thursday and I said in in Australia I mean it might be sort of similar in some European countries but when you get sort of to an airport um, sometimes you don't have the arm go straight to the plane you have Mm -hmm. to sort of go down the stairs walk and then you have to walk back up the stairs to get to the to the terminal and so I was a little bit you know I'm still a little bit scared of stairs even to this day and I sort of had my carry-on luggage with me so I took it it super easy and really simple and I went really really slow and I was walking slow for a reason because I was like okay like again it feels hard I really hate these sort of how hard it feels to walk up the stairs and how hard it feels to walk Mm -hmm. afterwards. And so I was slow and my mom obviously very sort of distressed about her father and sort of Mm -hmm. she wanted to sort of get out of the airport as soon as possible to get there. She had sort of zoomed ahead and was well sort of on her way out the airport. And I was sort of making my way up the gangway towards the terminal and fair and like straight away I felt myself go into that I was like oh like really like I was trying so hard not to <laughs> not to trigger it and um I got out there and again like I mean at this point I should have learned but my first thought was like okay well if I can just like maybe I can walk it off maybe it, like maybe it will go away maybe it will just to go away by itself and uh unfortunately it didn't and so I just I was like, no, nah, okay, I've got to stop. So I dropped my luggage and just sat down in the middle of the terminal. And I think that sort of raised a few eyebrows of people nearby. And luckily one of the girls or a girl nearby sort of asked me if I was okay. And I was like, no, I think I'm about to go into cardiac arrest. <laughs> and she went and got the flight staff and sort of went from there. And it was one of sort of the more interesting moments in my life where, you know, the par- you know the paramedics come and it's this big fiasco because you're in the middle of an airport, security's rushing over, like there's a bunch of sort of people involved. And when the uh, paramedics arrived, they needed to do an ECG, which is the like the the leads that sort of 
keep track of your sort of your heart rhythm. But uh, because I've got uh, a little bit of chest hair, it wasn't actually sticking to the pads. So <laughs> in the middle of the airport, they're like, okay, well, we need to take off your shirt and we're going to have to shave your chest hair off. So <laughs> there's, there's 300 people standing around me and I'm just there like getting yeah. my, my, my chest hair shaved off so they can do the CCG. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, well... That's 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 an experience. That's uh, <laughs> I'm never going to forget that 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 feeling. So it was probably the most embarrassing moment of my life. Um, but yeah, and like again, you know, my, my grandfather passed away that week, so it was quite an interesting week. And I guess it, you know, it it, it could have been a lot worse in that we could have lost my dog. I could have died and my grandma, you know, my mom could have been <clears throat> just would have been devastated. So um, luckily, I, yeah, I, the ICD saved me on that occasion. And what, and, does, uh, got, uh, what did your mom say, you know, when she rushed yeah. ahead? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so obviously I've been, you know, gone now for 20 minutes. I don't know where my mom was. I think she was well out of the airport waiting for our ride to pick us up. And I got a phone call while I was sort of sitting down on the ground getting handled by the paramedics. And I picked it up and, you know, this is it's sort of the relationship we have to, with each other. And my mom's first words were, uh, like where where the f are you? Where, like yeah. you know where, where where the f are you? And I was like, oh, you know, I just I just died. <laughs> and she's like, oh, again? All right, I'm coming back <laughs> today. And, so, so she's like, oh. and like she always blamed me for it. She's like, Jamie, like goddamn, like Jamie, like why? And I was like, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, no, it was uh, it was she did she did what she didn't mean, and she was sort of more concerned about her her father. So yeah, I definitely uh, there, there was nothing malicious in it or anything. So but yeah, no, it was uh, that was sort of uh, one of them again. Uh, there was either seven or eight, mm -hmm. um, and then sort of the most recent one that I've had um, was at a hospital actually. So since then I'd been recommended by the doctors here in London to sort of start talking about transplant and sort of, you know, obviously this has happened seven, eight times now and it didn't sort of seem to be stopping in any sort of sense. And they've done a bunch of tests. They've done a, an EP study, um, where they sort of fed some like wires and chemicals up through my groin to like, I think they literally tried to kill me. Like that was the point of the test because they just wanted to see <laughs> okay. how, like what would trigger it because they just don't know what was actually triggering these things. So they tried a bunch of things to to trigger a cardiac arrest, which is really weird feeling. You know, you sort of like, I was in this, operating theater and laying on a, a surgical table and all these guys, you know, sort of like looking around and was, they're like, Oh, we need you to strip down. And I'm like, okay. So I stripped down to my underwear and they're like, no, you need to keep, <laughs> you need to strip down even more. So you're sort of, you're laying naked on this uh, operating table and they're putting these chemicals in and they're like, okay, now we're going to give you a chemical that's going to try and put your heart into a cardiac arrest. And you're like, uh, no, that's how, okay. That's how it sounds like, I mean, like, <laughs> and so you sort of, you feel like your heart start to like really start going really, really fast, really, really fast and nothing happens. So that, that test failed. So I think, you know, I think they, they've tried and I just, I guess they they've, they've exhausted all the other op surgical options to help with my condition. So I think transplant now is the, Sort of apart from medication, I think the medication at the moment's working well enough. But transplant is the only sort of viable long term option. I think. Okay. Yeah. And so, so and then what, 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 when when did you die? <laughs> yeah. So, and, and what day was I'm it? Getting lost yeah, that, in my side story. And that's the other question. What day was um, that? Yeah, I, I I didn't keep track of that day actually. I, I'm not sure what day it was. Um, but yeah, so I was at the transplant hospital. Um, I was getting assessment done to see if I needed it. And a part of that assessment is a, a, a treadmill sort of exercise test. Um, I think it's a, called an MVO2 test, um, which is like a max, uh, you know, max uh, uh, yeah. oxygen, oxygen something. Like that, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, basically, you wear this sort of Darth Vader mask over your face and they sort of monitor how well you take in the oxygen and convert it. Um, and so I had done that previously. This wasn't the first time that I'd done it. And in the past, I had started to get that feeling all what like, again, like because I'm, I'm a little bit, you know, got that little bit of paranoia, even if I start to feel that feeling, even if it's not the real feeling, even if I start to feel something like it, I'll freak out and I'll stop mm -hmm. what I'm doing and just sort of, you know, try and calm back down to normal. 
So in the past, I had sort of got to that point where I've had this sort of little mini freak out and I've stopped the test. And I guess the, the way the test is run is that you're not allowed to stop because they want to see how well your body handles sort of exercise at that level. They can't have you sort of have a recovery period or like, you know, they, you need to sort of have that solid 10 minutes of data before they can sort of go on. Um, and so this time I was sort of like, you know, I'd been playing tennis. I'd felt, you know, felt feeling fitter than I had normally. Um, and I was sort of like, okay, I've got this, like, you know, I'm not going to stop this time. I'm going to last the whole 10 minutes and, you know, it, it's going to, it's going to be fine. And so jumped on and, you know, I was going well, six minutes in, I still felt fine. And then just like a snap, like just snap, like I felt the, felt the feeling. And again, it's, you know, it's as, even though as determined as I was to keep going, I can't describe that sort of that dread that you feel at that moment. It's just, no matter how resolved I was to keep going, my there's a deeper part of my brain that just told me, stop what you're doing, you're about to die. And so I was, uh, I told the cardiologist, who, uh, the, the physiologist who was with me on the treadmill and I said, I just felt the feeling I really want to stop. And he's looked at his ECG uh, monitor to my side and he said, no, everything's fine, keep going. And so and then a nurse put her hand on my back to keep me on the treadmill. And then... Uh, then I sort of, and then from that moment on, I sort of, that would, that was obviously the eight seconds. Cause I remember seeing him then slam the emergency stop button on the treadmill on the side. <laughs> um, he's yelled out, I need some help in here. And then I've sort of gone down and, you know, I had a nice dream of a, a warm yellow feeling and sort of woke up and so looked down and the, the nurse was sort of pumping oxygen into my mouth and the, Cardiologist, uh, the physiologist was doing CPR compressions on my chest because uh, they had actually turned off my ICD to do oh, that excellent. test. Excellent. So, okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, so it's, it's quite interesting, you know. I do. They they told me that they turn these I, the ICDs off in this test to prevent a, a false shock. So mm -hmm. when you exercise, your ICD might sort of be tricked into thinking that you're going into cardiac arrest. And I'm like, well, the irony is, I actually did go into cardiac arrest, and you had turned it off. So um, yeah, they had to do the full CPR, and yeah, I was in. I think it was code blue. There's a blue light flashing in the background, and 12 other doctors some of them still had sort of like gloves and sort of masks on they'd probably just come running from wherever they were sort of currently doing it and they were all just standing around me and it was a funny moment sort of after I'd recovered a bit one of the the nurse that put her hand on my back she sort of went over to one of the cardiologists and she was like oh it's weird he said he he, he knew it was coming before it came up on our machines and I was like like I, I effing told you so. <laughs> like no, no. you know, like next time, listen. <laughs> so uh, I'm not just being, I'm not just being unfit. I'm not just sort of complaining for complaint's sake. Um, and then after that, they obviously advised that I don't do exercise. Um, and that yeah, so you know, I've wanted to. I, I've sort of starting to feel a bit more fit lately, and the last couple of months, and I've really sort of tried to investigate going to gyms a bit more. But gyms just to like. No, we can't. We can't even like begin to insure you unless you go <laughs> and get like a, a written statement from the cardiologist and a sort of letter from the transplant hospital. And both of them have said no. So I'm like, okay, well, okay. <laughs> but yeah, no. Wow. So that was the okay. last time it happened. That was uh, that, that was yeah. how long ago? Uh, so that's actually been about a year now. Or, you know, coming up to eighteen months. So <laughs> okay. Okay. getting a little bit uh, paranoid again, but it's. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, the, so the, tick, the ticking time bomb in my chest is uh, probably due for another one anytime yeah. soon. But, How yeah. has this changed you as a as a person? Yeah, I mean, I I'd like to think you know I definitely I mean as you can tell I I joke about this sort of stuff a lot, um, and that's the sort of way that I deal with this sort of condition, and I definitely sort of think that the the way I've handled it has helped sort of keep me normal in some way and I, you know I'd like to think I'm still just as outgoing and sort of yeah, happy and fun loving as, as I always was um, it's definitely sort of you know made me just sort of realize you know I don't know if I probably wouldn't have come to London if I hadn't had this you know it, it's sort of it's that, that idea of like why not you know you've got one life it's not very long don't not do things don't don't make up excuses to do stuff and so it's definitely i think you know my day to day now i'm taking you know a little bit more risk especially when i go on holidays and things like that where you know i 
you know, recently I went to Las Vegas and, you know, I, I went shooting just because I wanted to go shooting and that sort of rests up against, you know, uh, the butt, I'm left-handed. So the butt of the gun sticks up against that sort of area and everyone's like, Oh, don't do it. Don't do it. Like, well, the worst case that happens is I die and I get brought back to life. <laughs> you know, it's the, mm. it's the, there's either, there's either two scenarios that happen is I die and get brought back to life or I just die. Either way, I'm not going to really know the difference. <laughs> you know, I'm either going to continue on living like I normally live or I'm, I, w- I won't know the difference anyway. And so I sort of, that, that's sort of a little bit more of a risk taking sort of attitude that I've got now with a lot of things. And, you know, there's a lot of rides and stuff at theme parks where they're like, you know, don't do this with a heart condition. And mm-hmm. I, I, I sort of, I like to ignore those warnings just to, you know, I like to think that, well, they probably won't even notice if I die. Anyway. <laughs> you know, by, <laughs> by the time the ride ends, I'll be, I'll wake up anyway. I'll be, I'll be awake and everything will be back to normal and I'll just walk away like nothing happened. <laughs> Are, yeah, are, you, so, are you afraid of dying in terms of that that thing won't save you once? Yeah, well, that's the scary part. And I mean, it, and it was probably the hardest news to hear from. I mean, it wasn't the greatest advice from a nurse, but I was getting wheeled out of one of the hospitals after one of my stays and was sort of, I was talking about these sort of like, you know, my sort of flippant attitude towards it. And she was like, you know, it's not going to save you every time, right? And I'm like... No, like, like, okay. don't. Well, why'd you say that? Like, don't, like, don't tell me that. And so that that really was like a like, oh shit! Like that was a bit of a a, a shock to hear, and definitely it's sort of yeah. And people sort of have asked me, you know, like, you know, especially in those final moments and stuff. It's like, oh well, like, do you know you're going? Do you know it's going to work? And I guess the answer is no. So, you know, a lot of the time is, you know, I might act like I've got the benefit of hindsight now to joke about it. But in those eight seconds, in those moments, I know that there is a high chance that I might not wake up after those eight seconds. So it's definitely like a, that sort of adds to that fear, I guess, and adds to that sort of anxiety around feeling those eight seconds. So, you know, it sort of definitely sort of builds into this sort of big sort of fear of it. Okay. And, but that device is not like a pacemaker, right? It's, it's, it just no, restarts so, it. Um, so why don't you have a pacemaker as well that might keep your, your heart stable? Yeah. So, I mean, the way I understand it, again, you know, people in the medical field would probably sort of scream that I'm saying inaccurate. But uh, a pacemaker is there to actually pace your heart's rhythm uh, mm-hmm. on a full-term basis. So people who need a pacemaker sort of have conditions where their heart can't naturally keep a steady rhythm going by itself so it needs some assistance with a pacemaker and the pacemaker is an always on sort of option uh, whereas my heart from what I understand it 99% of the time I'm my heart and everything about me sort of is completely normal and then it's just those sort of one sec those eight second moments where my heart for some random reason <laughs> chooses to uh have a dummy fit and, uh, you know, go, go into these sort of cardiac arrest rhythms. Um, so that, so in that case, I don't necessarily need constant monitoring. I just need it to work for those eight seconds. Okay. Um, and so I guess there's a, a difference in power needs and all those sort of technical stuff. But yeah, I think the difference is, is people who need pacemakers actually need sort of constant, uh, sort of support in a rhythm. Whereas I just need it to shock me back to life when, I go into cardiac arrest and pacemakers. I think there are dual function ones, but pacemakers by themselves don't provide that ability to shock you back if you do go into arrhythmia. Um, I mean, you've had nine close calls and and uh, let's hope not, but then in theory, the 10th might be the last one or the 11th or the 12th. Um, have, yeah. you prepared for, have you prepared for this? I mean, no, I mean, you know, there's a di- like, I definitely have had to have the sort of conversations and serious think, like, you know, I've had to sort of seriously sit down and think, you know, how do you handle dying in the 21st century? <laughs> you know, especially, you know, what happens to, I guess, you know, I've got the, I've almost got a benefit in knowing 
that it's coming <laughs> in a really, I don't know, like, I don't know the best way to say that, but, you know, it's so should I start preparing my, you know, questions like, should I, what should I do with my Facebook channel? Like, mm-hmm. you know, like, what do I, like, all my photos that I ever take and are on my Facebook account, I don't really, you know, they're either on cloud storage that, that I use different cloud platforms or Facebook and on social media. And so like, how did my family get access to any of my content Mm -hmm. when I pass away and things like that? And so, you know, I've definitely, I probably more so than the normal sort of 30 year old, I've had to sort of think about, you know, like how, how do I sort of like, yeah, how how do I sort of handle this if Mm -hmm. worse comes to worse? And, even, you know, the the sort of the scary part now being in London is obviously so far away from my family. I've got no family here in the UK. So, you know, if I do have full, you know, if there is sort of a time period before it actually sort of happens that maybe I get too sick and sort of goes down that route, especially with the transplant route, you know, do I want to be in England for that process? And will I be well enough to fly back to Australia or will my family have to fly here? So it's... um you know, it's it's definitely stuff I don't like to think about. Of course. Um, but it's you know, it's it's things that you've I've had to think about, I guess. And and you know, and that's that's the sort of those those aren't the fun sort of reflective moments of <laughs> of, of my day. Yeah. And have you have you like planned it out till the end? So have you decided I want to have a cremation or I want to be buried or? You, I haven't I mean, made no. I haven't made any formal plans. I, I mean, I'm definitely an advocate for donations. I've got my Australian donor card, my UK donor card. Um, <clears throat> definitely, I think you know. I mean, I'll go on a little spiel here, but the uh, you know in the UK and Australia at least, it's an opt-in system for donations. So you have to manually and specifically go to. I think you know it's the the Ministry of Transport or the Department of Transport and actually say that you want to be a donor and register for a donor. And, and even then your family can veto the process after you've passed away. So it's, you know, it's not even good enough to say that you want to do it yourself. You need to sort of make sure your family's aware of that. And my mom and my family are very much aware that I would want to be a donor should anything happen. Um, I mean, obviously, they won't be able to take my heart, but <laughs> they'll be able to <laughs> hopefully take some, some some of the other body parts. And yeah, definitely, I think, you know, people just need to realize that, you know, how much your organs mean to some people when they, you know, you you do not need your organs when you pass away. <laughs> yeah, you, you know, your body is a vessel for your brain and your consciousness. And once you've passed away, the rest of your body is just going to rot so might as well put it to use and actually help save some other people and you know eventually i'm going to need a heart transplant so you know it's unfortunately somebody's going to have to pass away but who has accepted that they want to be on the donation list and you know there is only one heart available for every 10 patients that need them at the moment so you know just there's just literally not enough people donating um so definitely yeah that that's my sort of wishes immediately and then perhaps donate my heart to a university to continue study, you know, mm-hmm. give me away as a cadaver. I mean, I, I, I'm very much of the sort of, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not religious. I'm not superstitious. So my body is a, a piece of flesh. And so they can, I, I, I want them to actually do something useful with it. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. And, um, it's, it's actually, uh, because I've recently talked to, um, Harold Mintz and Harold Mintz was in the year 2000, um, the first person in the U.S. to um, be a living donor of a kidney. So he basically said, yeah. Look, um, um, I'm going to give away one of my kidneys uh, because I can and someone is going to die today if I don't do it. So um, uh, yes, I might wait until a family member needs it or I might just do it right now. So so he did that. And um, we, um, we're we still in touch. And so actually we, we talked and I also ta- I told him about that I'm going to talk to you. And right. um, he had some questions, so so uh, okay. <laughs> probably like so. so I'm gonna gonna uh, note them down. So um, no, you, you are on the donors list or on the waiting list. Sorry, you're on the waiting list. Yeah, I'm. Yeah, I'm not sure on the specific. So there is this sort of. I've been told there's a Goldilocks period where you need to be sick enough to need a transplant, but you yeah, also yeah. need to be healthy enough to survive a transplant or have or have good odds to survive. And at the moment, I'm. I don't think. I'm sick enough, but I'm being seen by the transplant team regularly 
so that as soon as the moment comes that I need to be on the list, that I'll be put on that list. And and I think there's even multiple lists. There's like the there's an emergency list, and then there's a sort of just a, a waiting list, and then there's a sort of like a third like list as well. And then yeah. even then they they get broken down by British citizens, and then European citizens, and then Australian like other other citizens. So there, there's 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 plenty of lists, and you know it's just I think yeah it, I'm. I'm not sure technically where I stand on that, but yeah, I'm definitely in that process and going through that process. Okay. So uh, one of the questions that Harold uh, had was, um, if you ever wonder if it came to the moment where you get a transplant, who that heart might be from? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, you know, I get, so I had a, I've got a cousin who's had to go through the transplant process already. So I, I got to learn a lot from sort of watching them go through the experience and, you know, I think there's definitely this sort of, you know, it, it's a really sort of, I guess it's it's it's, it's, a, it's an emotional question really because you do have to come to terms that, you know, in, in the case of a kidney, luckily, you know, the people can donate kidneys without passing away. So, you know, it, there, there's 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 still a, a consideration there, but with with a heart, you have to sort of realize that. No, somebody has died to give you that heart. Like, you know, some family out there is grieving and, you know, they're going through loss and you've got this person's body part within you. So you sort of do have to sort of reconcile that. And people will, I think, deal with that in certain ways. And I don't know how I would deal with it until I go through it, I guess, or get to that experience. But sort of watching my cousin, I know that it's such a, uh, you know, a personal sort of moment of reflection and sort of um so how i would deal with it, i'm not sure i mean i don't know if i'd want to get in con- you know it's one of those things because you got to you know am i going to like would that family be proud of me like you know would they yeah you know, it's like you know would they want their child's heart to be within me or you know like am i going to do that heart justice you know and there's a lot you know if i find out that the heart belonged to this amazing you know, neuro, you know, like this really accomplished person, like, is there a responsibility then knowing that to do something more with my, you know, it's just, <laughs> so there, there's a lot of questions that you obviously think about and you just sort of, you have to sort of go through. And, you know, I think in, a, in many situations, people choose not to acknowledge the person. And, and I think that's a, a valid point on itself. I don't know if you've seen, the recent movie uh, Vice, which was about Dick Cheney. Yep. Uh, it's sort of like a, a comedy uh, biography-ish type movie on Dick Cheney, who is the uh, vice president of America. Um, and he had a heart transplant. And so he had one in. And, you know, in the movie, they make a point in sort of demonizing him and saying that, oh, he's such a cold person because when he got his heart, he never referred to it as somebody else's heart. He always referred to it as his new heart. And I sort of took issue to that because, you know, how, pe- you know, how people deal with such a big emotional thing is going to vary. And you're not necessarily a bad person if you don't necessarily want to think that somebody else's, you know, if you, if you want to forget that sort of negative aspect to it and that that's something to, so there should be something that's personal to that person. And it doesn't mean they're a bad person. It just means that that's how they want to deal. That's how they want to sort of reconcile this sort of process and this thought. And um, yeah, so I think, you know, I'm not sure exactly how I'll deal with it. I think it's just going to have to be something I'll take. I mean, I like to think that I'll still be lighthearted. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know, you know, I'll still joke about it. I think that's ingrained way much too much in my personality not to joke about it. I'll be making jokes about whose heart it is, I'm sure, and that I've got somebody else's heart and all the sort of puns and jokes you can think of. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, until that happens, I'm just not sure. Okay, okay. Do you think you would take over some characteristics of the other person? I mean, yeah, that, that's a sort of supernatural question, isn't it? Is yeah, yeah. How much does the no? I mean, I don't, I don't think so at all. And 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 in a respect, I do kind of agree with Dick Cheney in that, you know, a body part is a body part, and I think that's what people need to realize more is that, you know, I think one of the biggest reasons that people don't get donations is because they sort of feel like their organ is theirs. It's like it's a part of you know it. It contains 
their life or, you know, it, it's sort of, it's a part of their living experience and really we're machines and, you know, it's just, it should just be a matter of taking out one part and putting in another part. It's not, it, it hasn't sort of, it doesn't know the life it's lived. It doesn't, apart, you know, apart from the health conditions that people may have, it doesn't have a sort of memory or a, it, it doesn't sort of act as if it's, oh no, this is a, this is Jamie's heart, you know, or this, you know, it's like, no, like it doesn't know that. No, it's just, it's just another, it's, it's like going to the mechanic and getting a, a new carburetor put in your mm-hmm. car. It's just, you know, you're just, you're putting in a, a new spare part, okay, um, yeah. which obviously again, it's hard. It's probably hard for <laughs> people going through the grieving process to sort of think of it that way. And I can definitely understand it, but you know, there is such a donation problem at the moment and I think, you know, people attributing these sort of feelings of attachment and, and sort of saying, you know, oh, well, such and such was a painter and now you're going to be a painter. It's, mm-hmm. you know, I think that's just, it, yeah, I can definitely understand it. I just don't think it's, uh, it's you know, at the right, ca- the right healthy case for it. And uh, you know, looking at the other side of things, I mean, you mentioned that that's great person whose heart you might get potentially. What if you would get a heart from like this wife beating, child molesting, <laughs> racist, I don't know, dude, and you know it, uh, w- would you mind? Would you care? Would that- <laughs> no. Well, yeah. I mean, personally, I wouldn't care. And again, I can't speak for everybody that goes through the process because it is such a personal thing. But I, I, you know, in saying sort of about the, you know, for me, it's just, a, it's a part. It's a, it's a new part. And I think there was a really great advertising, you know, I, I'm in advertising, so I, I love to sort of keep track of advertising. And there was a really great advertising campaign done by the American Heart Association um, or, or a similar organization where it was actually, um, I, I, I sort of recommend everybody sort of go Google this. It was uh, about this really sort of um, asshole of a person and sort of he was really, you know, in his day to day life, he sort of, he had uh, like racist stickers on the back of his car and when it came to like he, he went to a, a cafe and he didn't tip the waitress and he mm-hmm. sort of slapped her on the bum and like it was a really sort of and sort of the premise is, is like this guy was a was a, a nasty piece of work his entire life but he dropped out of a, a cardiac arrest just after he left the uh, cafe and they found out that he had an organ donor card in his wallet. And so it was like, well, you can be a, you can be a nasty piece of work your entire life, but you can actually do some good after it by being a donor. And so it does, you know, it, it doesn't really matter how bad you are a person in your life, just, you know, be a, being a donor sort of helps somebody else then live a life. So yeah, it's, uh, I don't think it would affect me at all. And um, Harold has another question that I found found quite interesting. Um, Let's say you would be at the point where it's so bad that you really need a heart now, basically, and then it's 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 this or then uh, well the worst way. And um, now, if if funds wouldn't be an issue, would you consider a heart from the black market because there is a black market for organs? Would that be something I would say? I mean. It, it's scary to think. I mean, I definitely, obviously, wouldn't make that in my. T- it wouldn't be in my top ten of situations of sort of you know before it got to that point. I feel like there's you know tech like um, there's these machines called LVADs, which is like a a, a digit a device that acts like a heart. So there have been cases of sort of people who have lived up to two years on these sort of machines. So they've literally haven't got a heart in their body. They've just got this machine and it sort of sits as a backpack on their, like on their sort of belt and runs through that. So, you know, I think there's definitely, you know, that, that would get me by for at least two years if worse came to worse. And hopefully by then uh, a legitimate donor gets matched. And, you know, after that I'd start perhaps looking at more sort of, the experimental technology, um, you know, the sort of the the stem cell grown hearts and the the or the the actual machine replication heart replicators and things like that. So um, it's definitely it, it's not something that I'd want to consider. But I mean, obviously, you don't want to die either. So mm. I couldn't say if 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 all of my options were exhausted, I definitely you know it. I, I wouldn't throw it off the table, but it's not. I definitely don't want it to get out. Like I don't want to put out there that it's not in my top. Like it's not something that I'm gonna like be like. Oh, okay, I'm gonna go. I can't get a. I can't get a heart transplant now. In the next six months or two years, I'm gonna go buy a heart. No, it's like okay. I'm not. Like that's. Okay. It's just that would be. 
the worst of the worst case scenarios. And then it's a tough question. I mean, you know, you never know how you react when your life is on the line. Yeah, you know, so, and again, it also depends on, you know, you know, even if it's a black market heart, has the person died that, you know, you obviously don't want to be an accessory to murder in a sense. Like, you know, you don't want to be a part of an industry that has literally killed somebody to give you a high. I don't think that is appropriate. I mean, from a black market point of view that I would only ever consider is if it is some sort of natural heart that has been privately donated or the family has decided to, instead of donating it publicly, is donating it through monetary means. You know, it, it, it's definitely something that, there's levels within that you'd have to consider, but yeah, okay. <laughs> something I don't, you know, definitely it, it shouldn't even be on the table. It's sort of, it's, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. yeah it's, it's a shame that that industry exists, but yeah. it's, uh, yeah. But I guess, I mean, that's, that's uh, something for everyone who's watching this, listening to this, uh, go, go ahead, uh, get your or organ donor card. I mean, I'm also an organ donor. Well, not yet, but I will be at some <laughs> point. And um, uh, as you said, I mean, the body is, is a, it's a box full of spare parts that someone might need at some point and you know, it takes a few minutes to fill out the thing and um, you know, everyone yeah, should do it. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah, and I think especially in Europe, I think the tide's changing um, to make it an opt-out system, which will really yes. help. So, I think, I think uh, Denmark or, or Denmark or Sweden or something like that, they have this opt-out system, which is way yeah. better. They, they have like so 97% think, donor rate, which is, exactly. yeah, that, that's how it should yeah. be. Actually. You know, I think as soon as it becomes opt-out, <clears throat> donation shortages won't be an issue because there'll be so many organs available that there'll be more organs than there will be people who need mm -hmm. them. So I think, you know, de definitely, you know, support politicians that support opt out and uh, go from there. And, you know, it's still, if you, if you have religious objections, you can object, but by default, it will be taken as being in instead of out. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, you mentioned that, no, that, not that you mentioned religion, you're um, an atheist. Um, have you always been an atheist? Has that changed since you had your experiences? Yeah. Or, um... <laughs> I mean, it's interesting. And I, and I, I mean, I, I look forward to seeing the comments on this, <laughs> um, especially when I've sort of said this in, in previous interviews um, that I, I've had in, in newspapers is, you know, straight away, I've had death threats on Facebook from Christians saying that, they're going to send me to hell and I'm going to hell because I don't believe in Jesus and the afterlife. And mm -hmm. yeah, there, there was a, a Chinese person who actually messaged me on Facebook saying that they weren't the perfect Christian, but they think that I should, you know, I'm going to hell if I don't believe in such and such. And I was like, wow, like I didn't like you're Chinese. Like, Hey, I didn't, necessarily think that Christianity was that big in China and B, I'm pretty sure Facebook's illegal. So you're breaking the law to threaten me about going to hell. I was like, that's, that's dedication. But um, no, so yeah, I, I am an atheist. I've always been an atheist. Um, it's always seemed to make sense to me. I've never really grown up religious in, in any sort of sense. Um, and, and even to the point, you know, I, I, I do believe that I've become a stronger atheist since these events uh, than before. And it's almost, you know, I think I just, I'm starting to, I, you know, you, I definitely lose my patience a little bit more these days with, you know, people who claim they've had near death experience, you know, or, you know, claim they've experienced the afterlife uh, from sort of these events. And it, it's not so much, you know, I definitely don't, I don't think they're lying. I don't, you know, I, I know firsthand now that they, could experience something and they mm -hmm. that they are perhaps experiencing something for me like i start to lose patience now in that sort of arrogance of saying that because they experienced it that makes it the afterlife or that makes it real and mm -hmm. you know I, again being sort of atheist and scientifically minded sort of all my life you know i'm, I'm much more inclined to know or think that my brain is very easily tricked and it's not infallible. And I just sort of lose patience with people that think that their brains are so special that just because they had a nice dream of meeting Jesus, that means that it really happened and they went to hell, you know, and it's sort of, you know, you, ne you never really, and again, just sort of on these experiences, you never really sort of meet a Christian who wakes up and say they met Muhammad, you know, you never really, you don't, you don't have the Muslim that woke up and was like, oh, actually the, the Christian God is re like, the, is real. And I went to heaven not to, there weren't 72 versions, you know, it's, it's so subjective to your local experience. And I 
previously have been to New York and I really like New York. So I can imagine why that <laughs> manifested. Well, in it. Like, not so sure know. about that. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> but I can imagine, you know, and, and that, that sort of helps explain why that manifested in my experience. And, you know, and just that I know from the chemical dumps of adrenaline, um, you know, all the different sort of uh, neurological chemicals that are going through your brain. I mean, like, you know, when people talk about near-death experiences, like the, your body is freaking out. Like it's going through such an experience and it's doing everything it can to grasp onto some sort of like sort of functioning level. And it's just, you know, how, how can you say that you can trust your body at that point? Like, how can you say that your brain, I mean, you can, you can trick your brain right now by Googling optical illusions that no chemicals are needed at all. You can make yourself think that a circle is moving when it isn't. So if you can't even differentiate when you're awake and you're conscious that something is real or it isn't real, mm -hmm. how can you differentiate when you're going through a experience like that, that something is real or not real? So, um, yeah, I think, you know, I've started to lose a little bit of patience uh, since I've had all these events. And um, so it's definitely strengthened my uh, atheism in a way uh, from that point of view. Okay, okay. It's probably the same with uh, psychedelic drugs. I mean, I've talked to Dr. Rick Stressman um, a few months ago and um, the drug he's been researching, DMT, um, he's been researching it for a, a few years in the mid 90s. And the funny thing is people went through very similar experience regardless of their belief and their status and where they're coming from. And, and um, what we talked, he's at a point where he believes that this might be actually let's say, a, a pathway or a doorway to whatever else there is out, outside of there. So, sure, yeah. And <laughs> I mean, you know, I think he obviously will know much more about the science behind it than I do. But from face value, when I look at something like that, I would probably suggest that it's actually the opposite. The fact that everybody, regardless of their belief or their background, is experiencing the same thing that should say perhaps that that is the actual way that that chemical reacts with the human body, you know? So it doesn't matter if you're Muslim or Christian, if you're all experiencing the same thing, it just shows that you're all human and that this chemical has a certain reaction with human bodies that causes this sort of experience. So, you know, I mean, obviously I don't, I, he, he, obviously we'll know the more about the science and sort of what's possible and not possible. And he's sort of free to have his own beliefs. And, but yeah, I mean, I, I feel like there's always more of a, a more natural uh, explanation to these sort of things and okay, uh, okay. jumping to the supernatural. <laughs> so did you ever have any experiences on psychedelic drugs that would be similar? No, no. I mean, I, I've tried to keep clear of uh, psychedelic drugs. You know, <laughs> okay. In terms of, you know, what, what has changed in my life, I definitely have a much more, uh, it's different relationship with alcohol and drugs. Um, you know, I sort of, I want to, I don't want to a either just a flat out poison my body either more than I, it is poison. And, you know, I'm on quite a few chemi uh, quite a few medications as it is. Um, and then the other part is that, you know, I don't want to alter my perception of life mm -hmm. to a point where it's sort of, you know, it, life for me is the way I experience at the moment is everything. And so experiences are everything and living, just living is everything to me. And so I don't want to sort of ruin that by sort of perceiving it in any other sort of way, I guess. So I sort of definitely has changed my sort of attitude towards these sort of, uh, sort of different chemicals and uh, drugs and alcohol as well. How has this impacted your social life? How do you, friends react or are your friends afraid? Because I have to be honest, you know, we've been in touch for a while now and, and it's probably completely strange, but you know, when you didn't reply right away, I was always thinking, oh Jesus, did something happen to him? Like, did, <laughs> did he die now between the last email and why isn't he not replying for the past two or few days? Like, I mean, it's probably, a, probably, probably a, a stupid thought to think, but you know, no, that, that's, that's, kind of, that's kind of stuff yeah. that just goes through your head or at least went through my head. So do you have friends who say, oh, Maybe we shouldn't you know, do this or that with him because you now what if he dies while we're, I don't know, playing poker or, or are at a restaurant? So. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I definitely, I think, you know, I've tried to make my heart like sort of, I think my friends know now uh, that, you know, it, it's something I live with, but it's not something that I sort of let stop me. And, and even sort of on the alcohol and sort of going out, point, I'm still the first one to go out to the pub and go sort of out out to a club afterwards. Um, 
I don't definitely don't let it stop me. I just don't participate in some of the more sort of the drug taking and, and that sort of thing. So um, it, it's definitely like I'm still out there and doing it. My friends know sort of I will tell them when I've hit my limit and worst case scenario is I'll tell them when I feel that eight second feeling. Um, and so they've been really, really understanding just, you know, and they've been great and just sort of helping me, you know, especially when I walk these days and go upstairs, you know, I need to take 20 seconds to calm down and just sort of, you know, I, I still get a little bit of anxiety when I walk and when I sort of go up, especially when I go upstairs, you know, stairs have killed me eight times now. <laughs> so every time I go up a set of stairs, I'm just like, not this time, not this time. Like, it's sort of, so I do have a sort of little bit of anxiety when I sort of, and then, you know, they've been really supportive and just sort of understanding that I need to take a break every now and again. Um, but it does definitely when you're meeting somebody new uh, and sort of, you know, and dating and things like that, you do sort of have to see that just suck it up a little bit or sort of, <laughs> it's quite funny as you were saying, you know, like you didn't know if I'd passed away or you didn't know if I was, uh, if, if I'd had a cardiac arrest or not. Um, I was actually sort of talking to a girl online and not on these sort of dating apps and we'd arranged to have a date and I'd sort of, that was just uh, before I went into cardiac arrest last time at the treadmill. <laughs> and so this was, because uh, I think that actually, to be fair, I don't, I don't want to say it, but I think it may have been a Thursday. Um, and then uh, <laughs> now that I think about it, because I was in hospital, from uh-huh. they kept me in observation Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and I was supposed to go out that weekend. And uh, I remember just sort of messaging her on the Sunday and just being like, Oh, sorry, I didn't get in touch. I uh, I died on Friday. <laughs> like I, I died last <laughs> week. I couldn't. Uh, I, we couldn't go out. And she's like, "What do you mean you died?" Like, so, and then had to go through the whole story. And it's it is definitely a talking point when you do meet new people, and you know, everybody wants to ask a hundred questions. And mm-hmm. um, but no, it, it's more you know, especially now when you, you know you just got to. Jo- I, I joke about it. So when people and it, whenever somebody makes a pun, like, "Oh, you know, I, I like I literally died when I found out about such and such," and I'm like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, try it, you know, try it someday. <laughs> you know, I'll tell you about literally dying about stuff. You know, it's just uh, it's just you know, you just gotta make fun of it. And I think you know, people, yeah, you know, and you know, people put it even to a negative effect. And that probably you know, people now socially think of it more as a joke than an actual serious. You know, it's just, it's just a, a joke that I tell people now, not an actual thing that I go through. But um, yeah, okay. no, I think that's uh, the better way to handle it. Well, where do you take your um, sense of humor from? Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, I think it's just I like I like to think it's very Australian. I mean, I don't, I don't know how true that is. I think it's you know a little bit sort of patriot uh, patriotism in in myself. But you know, I feel like always have grown up in a very I've never had any worries. And you know, it's the Australian phrase, you know, no worries. It's like you don't really have to. Yeah, and even even people that sort of you know ask me now, it's like, well, aren't you worried about being in England and sort of all this? And I'm like, well, you know, the benefit of being Australian is that worst case scenario is I have to go back to Australia. <laughs> it's like <laughs> I have to go back to Australia. Oh my god, I've got to go to a place called the Sunshine Coast and live out the rest of my life like back there. And so, really, I don't have to worry about that. And Australia's got a good healthcare system, which again, so I don't have to worry about that. And I haven't had to worry about that here in England. So I think, you know, it's definitely afforded me the ability to keep it in the, you know, sort of, you know, just compartmentalize it into the back of my mind and sort of not, you know, not worry about it. And that sort of then lends itself into just making jokes at its expense. And I think, yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I think we've always, I've grown up on comedy pro. Yeah, I couldn't even say where, where I get my sense of humor from. But um, yeah, it's definitely just sort of the, the, the way I deal with it. And, yeah. Okay. And does it impact the way you plan your future? Like you mentioned at the moment you're single. So if you would find a partner and you, know, you would think about kids, for example, would you say, oh, maybe, maybe that's not something because you never know and I have this condition or... Yeah, definitely. I mean, I I do want kids. Um, and then I obviously sort of then think about, you know, the the sort of the genetic screening treatments and the sort of the, you know, I follow, uh, there's a new process called CRISPR, which, you know, has the possibility of, you know, sort of selectively getting rid of the sort of the, the this gene that's in our family um, oh. or, you know, and sort of, uh, or, you know, the different options are around sort of that. Um, and then obviously age comes into it as well. And, you know, I do sort of worry that time is ticking and things like that. And, you know, the, when, you know, it's quite, 
it's quite somber of it. It's quite, you know, when you, when I go to the transplant hospital, um, they've got a plaque on the wall and the plaque is we've got the world record for the longest surviving heart transplant patient. And I'm like, Oh, well that's reassuring. And then you look and it's like 28 years and you're like, well, I kind of want to live longer than another 28 years kind of thing. And so you just sort of think like, well, you know, like if I have it now, you know, do it like, will I be healthy enough in 15 years when they're a teenager and things, you know? So yeah, it's definitely something that I do think about. Um, and do want to think about it and sort of planning for it. But then there's also, you know, I'm not there yet with my career. Um, I've had a great time here in London. I've been in London now for six years. Um, I do want to make America my next stop. So sort of my next chapter, I want it to be in the United States. How does health insurance play out on that? How does the political situation, you know, <laughs> luckily with Obamacare recently, you know, so in the last couple of years, I can actually get insurance because if I went there previously, most of the insurance companies probably just wouldn't even insure me or they, you know, wouldn't, they just have ridiculously high premiums. So now with sort of the more of the latest changes, I can at least get insured and mm-hmm. be treated the same way. Um, so we'll see how that plays out on the the new government and future governments, but I definitely have to keep my eye on those sort of things. You know, the biggest thing that does stop me from moving to America is health. So it's the, it's the one thing it says, you know, it's not the money, it's not job, it's not anything else. It's like, what's the health insurance? Like what, what will I do for health insurance? So um, it's definitely something I have to keep track of in my future plans. And, um, and then there is this, you know, the, the, there is the expectation, I guess, from cardiologists, you know, I take it very lightly, but I think cardiologists expect that, you know, it is going to get worse soon or quickly. And so, you know, at, you know, it's, it's this unknown that I have to plan for, you know, what if I do need a transplant next year? What if I need it in two years? You know, do, you know, how does that process happen? You know, a lot of it is also, you know, like because I've lived outside of Australia for so long now that I'm not sort of on their medical system anymore, like sort of as a patient. So, if I was to go back, if I was to need a heart transplant and I decided to go back to Australia to go with it with my family, I'd have to go back onto the Australian system. You know, I'd have to go through all the processes of seeing the cardiologists, of doing the tests, of sort of getting all those sort of steps. And that's not going to be a quick process. That's, you know, that may take six months on its own. So not only do I need to know six months in advance, if I need a transplant, I sort of, you know, need to make sure that I'd, I'm healthy enough to travel to back to Australia within those six months to get a transplant and start that process. So yeah, it's definitely, I mean, it definitely complicates my future plans, but in saying that, you know, I, I, I feel like I have this sort of bug of adventure and sort of risk. And I do just want to sort of, I think my next movie is just to sort of pack up England and, move to New York and uh, <laughs> that's where I'll sort of move to make hell. my next chapter and I'll sort of, I'll, I'll see how it plans out. Again, worst okay. case scenario, I have to go back to Australia. So uh, that's the, uh, you know, that's the worst case scenario. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And in terms of your, I mean, the, the psychological component um, of it, you mentioned that you had these like almost PTSD like sim- symptoms where you were, you know, Thursdays are obviously a thing that's uh, <laughs> not too high on your priority list, I guess, than the stairs. So, so what does it do to you in, in your day-to-day life? Yeah, so I mean, I, I do, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's really hard, I guess, for me just to even tell the differences and sort of, you know, I do try work on it. Um, but I went and saw a counselor once to sort of get help with these sort of feelings. And, you know, so at the moment I sort of walk and then I'll maybe get five minutes or 10 minutes and I'll get stuck in it. Like, it's quite funny. Like I can now tell when I'm starting to get anxious about it so it you know it's just it's it's a quick phrase like even even to the point where like one of my friends will be like oh you haven't stopped recently <laughs> and then like <laughs> that is just like okay. oh shit i haven't like you know i haven't stopped should i stop what like should we keep going and then and then that like causes me to sort of get anxious okay. and then okay. that feeling of being anxious is similar to the feeling of going into cardiac arrest so you know it's this sort of really quick vicious cycle that speeds up and then i just i just i just like no i have to stop i have to stop mm-hmm. like i'm just gonna stop and stand here for five minutes and just get my breath um and so again being with sort of friends that understand that and are, are really supportive of that has helped um but yeah you know it's i like to joke that you know i'll stop in the middle of the road if i have to and i have stopped in the middle of the road i was crossing trafalgar square um here in london and 
I sort of felt that feeling and I was like, well, it's quite a wide road. So I could either try and push through it or just stop in the middle of the road. And so I stopped in the middle of the road and just waited for 20 seconds and people beeping their horns. And I'm just like, well, I haven't been hit by a car yet, but I've died nine times from walking. So I'm just kind of, yeah. <laughs> I'll take my chance. I'll take my chances with the cars. I think it's, I've probably got a better, better, better rate of survival. But, um, so yeah, you know, it's definitely this sort of this, there is this sort of element that I do need to get over, but I went and saw a counselor and he's like, okay, well, when you feel those feelings, keep walking, like just, just push through them. You'll, you'll slowly train your body to realize that they're nothing. They're just your brain playing tricks on you. And so I was like, okay, great. So we went out the back of the hospital and went for a walk and the counselor's like, how are you feeling? I'm like, oh yeah, I'm feeling fine. And then no, I felt it. I felt like this sort of feeling. I was like, I felt the feeling like I, I really want to stop now. And he's like, nope, let's just keep walking, keep pushing through it. And so I got about two seconds more and I was like, nope, it's done. And then so I sat down and I went into cardiac arrest. And so I was like... <laughs> that's the, that's like, one death we missed, I guess. Yeah, yeah so it's I'm just you. like, well, yeah. that, that's, you know, like you're here, you know, your, your job to get me over these things and you practically just proved that the feelings I feel could you know, not all, not all, not all cases, obviously, but they could lead to a cardiac arrest. And so it definitely makes me sort of, you have to evaluate each time. Like, is it worth like, you know, is it really worth walking? Like if you feel like I need, if I feel like I need to stop, is it worth me keep going considering it could lead to my death? So it's like, you know, it's kind of that, that idea. Like, you know, if I take, so you do sort of then get stuck in these loops of, you know, if I take another step, I'm, you know, like you do start like watching your steps. Like I can't even take another step. And I've frozen up a few times on stairwells because I'm like, like if I take one more step up the stairs, I'm going to die. Like, so you do get into these sort of dark cycles in your head, but um, yeah, it's definitely, I think it's, it's getting a bit more manageable and that comes over time. And, you know, it does take about 18 months or so, like I said previously, to actually almost start to forget that you've got the condition. And so you just sort of get back to, to normal. But there is this sort of big period where you just, you're constantly paranoid and you sort of really sort of, and, you know, and, and nightmares and all that sort of stuff that comes with the PTSD type symptoms. So. Um, I, we started the interview um, or the conversation um, with the mention that this is actually quite a common common uh, condition to have. Um, is there anything people can, can people test for this? Can be yeah. So I think nowadays they're quite advanced on their testing um, and they can do, you know, uh, gene testing as well to see if you've got specific genes. Um, I think the UK has been really good on sort of getting um, just general cardiac testing out to young people um, because sort of like in my case, um, the, the sort of the biggest killer, I guess, of this condition um, is that people just assume that you're young, fit and healthy. You don't have a problem. And so, you know, they, they think, oh, you played soccer, you played cricket your entire life. Like you, you're fit and healthy. You're, you don't have a heart condition. Only really big 65 year olds, you know, who have eaten junk food all their lives have heart conditions. And so that's the most dangerous aspect of it. And, you know, I think, getting people to realize that no, even like, you know, unfortunately there was a case of a girl who the same weekend as um, Carrie Fisher, Princess Leia passed away from a cardiac arrest. Mm -hmm. That same week there was an eight year old girl in Ireland who passed away from it on a flight back home to Ireland. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's that sort of realization that like just, she was a perfectly normal, healthy, seemingly healthy eight year old girl, but she had this sort of hidden, heart condition that didn't go checked and it just randomly chose that moment to go into cardiac arrest. So I think, you know, making sure that just because you think that you're young, fit and healthy, go get yourself checked out and don't sort of, you know, and I think there was a more famous example of a, a football player. Um, I think he played for Tottenham um, and he actually had a cardiac arrest on the pitch. Like this is a professional athlete who, you know, is, been probably sort of working out 10 hours a day for all his life and yet he just sort of dropped dead on on the football pitch from a cardiac arrest because of a condition that he didn't even know he had um so yeah it's definitely go get yourself tested um you can't your gen, your general practitioner your local doctor should be able to sort of point you in the right direction okay um i want to close this conversation and there's um 
two questions I always ask at the end. And the sure. first question is, um, this is about you know, extraordinary people in you know, different fields and from different um, places around the globe. And you certainly are <laughs> quite extraordinary. <laughs> just just by the like, fact um, that you died nine times, but also I think by, by how positive you are <laughs> and by uh, no, how you uh, managed to re remain your good spirits and your humor and, and um, everything. And uh, Who do you consider to be someone extraordinary? Uh, I mean, for me, I, I guess sticking with the science theme, I, you know, and also I guess a, a science and advertising the same way. Like I have massive respect for those that help bring science to life and sort of make the scientific like scientific method and the scientific way uh, exciting. And so for that reason, you know, for me, people like Bill Nye and uh, oh my god. Uh, Stephen Fry and um, my mind's just blanked and I feel really, really bad. Uh, the astrophysicist um, who's also <laughs> really outspoken about this. Um, uh, oh my God, I can't believe I blanked on his name. So um, the, 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 that oh, yeah. that uh, color dude? Uh, yes. Yeah, so, uh, Neil, um, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Neil deGrasse Tyson. That's, yeah, oh my yeah, God. Yeah. I'm sorry, Neil deGrasse yeah, Tyson. Yeah. If you do yeah. ever see this... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you're one of my idols i just like you know so it, it's this idea of you know not just like sort of being great scientists themselves and sort of contributing in that way but more so the fact of you know making it exciting for young people to think about science and so that, you know and and making it cool and sexy and sort of making it you know accessible to everybody so definitely a mad uh, uh mad props for those guys okay <laughs> yeah. okay and uh, last question, um, what's your message to everyone who's listening or who's watching? Yeah, so, I mean, f for me, it's sort of this thing, that it's definitely sort of struck home because of this. It's just, you know, a lot of people, especially sort of the religious, you know, they ask, well, how can you find meaning if you don't believe in a religion? And for me, especially with this all happening, you know, it's I, I am so awe-inspired that, I exist at all. Like it is like, it is unbelievably amazing that I'm still alive. And so that, you know, and it's unbelievably amazing that I was even alive in the first place. You know, it took 3 billion years for Earth to get to a point where it could take life. You know, life evolved over another billion years. I and mean, scientists would probably correct me on that. But, you know, it's just the fact that then randomly, uh, you know, pregnancy and birth that happened and I became the person I am like that's just so amazing and so I just I implore people you know like there's always you know you know they say oh I don't have a reason for living and you know I might be you may get depressed and you you, you feel like you, you sort of you don't have a reason to exist but just existing in its own sense is just amazing so like I'd really want to get out there that you know just just take solace in the fact that you're alive at all like that is an amazing achievement in and of itself. So, you know, like go and enjoy life however you want to. You don't have to be a professional football athlete, you know, just enjoy life how you want to enjoy it. It doesn't, you don't have to, there's no standard you have to live to. You're alive. So be great, like, be, you know, celebrate the fact that you're alive. So birthdays are a massive deal for me. <laughs> it's, a, it's literally a celebration of being alive each year. So I, uh, I def, yeah, no, you know, so just, yeah, that, that's probably my sort of biggest message is just, uh, just appreciate being alive. Jamie Poole, thank you so much for your time and okay. it was a great conversation. Yeah, thank you very much. Talk soon. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you for watching. And in a few seconds, you'll hear about the extraordinary person that I'm going to talk to in my next conversation. But before that, I need to ask you for your help. See, finding people who inspire and motivate you to make a change, that's what's most important to me. But to connect you with these amazing people and to bring you conversations that you will not find anywhere else, I need you to become a part of our journey. So please get involved and leave a comment below with your own questions and maybe even tell me who I should talk to next. And if you know anyone who might like this conversation, then please share it because I'm sure that they will like it too and it will help to grow this channel and to make an impact together. And by the way, on my website, you will find all current and upcoming episodes, including show notes and transcripts, background info, books and websites of my guests, podcast links, and much more. And once you become an email subscriber, there is always some exclusive content. So don't forget to sign up and I'll see you in the next conversation.
In the next episode, Rob talks to Bob Arno. As the king of pickpockets, he's been traveling the world and stealing everything from wallets to watches to belts to ties on stage for over six decades. But his work doesn't stop there. He has mingled with criminals, thieves and con artists from all over the world to learn more about their tactics and techniques and the psychology behind these crimes. His unique knowledge has made him one of the most sought-after safety experts on the planet and he's in high demand by law enforcement agencies around the world to help them understand how criminals think and work and how to protect us all from becoming victims of crime. Rob and Bob talk about how he got into pickpocketing in the first place, the amazing amount of money a skilled street pickpocket can earn from this profession, how you can protect yourself and your family while traveling, and much more. Join the conversation now.